Welcome back to the classical universe. Today, we will be analyzing the motion of objects in the solar system to see if we can arrive at results identical to those deduced from Einstein's general theory of relativity in regions of weak gravitation, particularly Einstein's approximation of Newton Newton's gravitational equation and the precession of the orbits of planets. In 1609, Johann Kepler announced his first law of planetary motion, which stated that all planets moving round the Sun did so in an elliptical orbit, with the Sun, or star, always at one of the five of the ellipse. During that time, there was no mathematical framework by which this could be explained. It was more than half a century later that Isaac Newton published his equation of universal gravitation, which explained how it was possible for planets to orbit the Sun and why those orbits were elliptical. However, there was a shortcoming to this law. It was known that the orbits of planets precessed as the planets moved around the Sun. That is, the major axis, which is the longest line joining two points in an ellipse, constantly changed for each revolution of the planet. This precession was thought to be caused by the combined gravitational effect of the other planets in the solar system. However, when astronomers attempted to calculate the rate of precession using Newton's law, there were discrepancies especially for planets orbiting really close to the Sun, such as Mercury. This was such a big deal to the extent that Newton's law became resented by most scientists of the time, and was almost discarded altogether. After Einstein published his general theory of relativity in 1916, the solutions to his equation accounted for that very accurately, and that is why till today, this is held as the strongest proof that general relativity is correct. When you solve Einstein's equations for the solar system where gravity is not that strong, you get a force equation identical to Newton's equation, but for the addition of some term in the denominator which suggests a slightly weaker gravitational force than proposed by Newton. In this video, I am going to show that you could arrive at the same form of the equation by just analyzing the solar system more technically, but without general relativity. It is known that the Sun is far from stationary, a fact that is usually ignored when analyzing solar systems and other celestial systems. In addition to the spinning motion of the Sun about its axis, it also revolves around its alert center of mass in a small orbit, that is, that is, the star wobbles. The radius of this orbit is often so small that, relative to the orbits of other planets, the star is at the center and does not move. Let us draw this orbit like so. The white dot represents the center of mass in the case where this motion is ignored. Let the radius be denoted by Rs. The orbit of a planet orbiting this star is therefore as shown. I have exaggerated the size of the star's orbit for clarity purposes, so don't pay too much attention to the ratio of the orbits. Let's represent the distance between the planet and the star at this point as Rp. We shall take this as our reference point. For simplicity, let's assume that both the star and the planet are moving anticlockwise. Therefore, at some small time t, the sun will be here and the planet would also have changed position. Since the orbit of the sun is so small, in this small time, the change in position of the planet will be negligible compared to the change in position of the star. Again, I have not drawn to scale. Now that you get the idea, let me remove the exaggerated position of the planet. Now we see that the distance between the star and the planet is given by this line here, that we shall call R. Let us link the two positions of the star by a chord line and label it RC. Now we have a triangle with angle of interest theta. Theta represents the angle between the positions of planet and star. 
that is it measures the difference between the angle made by the chord of the and the angle made by RP all measured from our reference horizontal line now let's zoom in on this we shall denote the angle of this chord by theta s for a chord these other two angles are equal so we denote them by theta 1 let's call the angle that the chord makes with our reference line theta 2 and, and that which the earth makes with the line theta p so we see that the effective angle between the chord and the earth theta is equal to theta 2 minus theta p since the green line and the red line are parallel the angle between them is 180 degrees this means that theta 2 is equal to 180 minus theta 1 the sum of the angles of a triangle is always equal to 180 degrees so we have theta 1 plus theta 1 plus theta s equal to 180 degrees therefore theta 1 is equal to 90 minus theta s over 2 Subbing this in the equation of theta 2 yield theta 2 equal to 90 plus theta s over 2 since theta is equal to this we can now sub in the expressions for theta 2 and theta p to have this we have just written 90 degrees in radians as pi over 2 let us now analyze distances for some small time t notice that i have ignored the new position of the planets because of the explanation i gave earlier that the angular velocity of the planet will be far smaller than that of the star in these limits we see that rc is changing as well as r which is the effective distance between the two masses but not rp from the cosine rule we have the following expression note that this equation is valid regardless of whether rp changes or not we can write rc as a function of rs which is a constant using the chord equation as follows subbing that and this expression for theta in the above green equation yields this by using the trigonometric identity cosine of pi over 2 plus a equal to minus sine of a this equation can reduce to this so that everything is in terms of sine since theta p is smaller than theta s we can ignore it that means this difference is approximately equal to theta s over 2 now we have sine theta s over 2 times sine theta s over 2 which is equal to sine squared theta s over 2 which is now a common factor so the effective distance between any planet in a solar system and its star is given by given by the following yellow expression for any two planets we have to use the previous equation because theta p will then be significant so you can see that if r s is equal to zero the equation reduces to r equal to r p the radius of the planet and this is the approximation that is always used in solar system analysis writing theta s in terms of the angular velocity of the sun yields this now what does newton's law of universal gravitation state it states that the force between any two masses is proportional to the product of their masses and inverse the proportional square of the distance between them for the case of the sun and the planet the effective distance is given by the above equation and this distance is not a constant but changes with time for all our day-to-day -day objects and experiments on earth theta s and theta p are both zero because the objects are static that is why this form of newton's equation works so well but in the scale of the cosmos a small rotation can make a very big difference so for this scale newton's equation is written as follows 
because of the presence of an angular term in the equation, it is now clear that there must be an extra rotation apart from that predicted by the normal Newton's equation, and this intuitively is the precession of the, of the orbit. I can also write this equation in this form, where r prime is the sine term. Now, this looks exactly like the result gotten from analyzing Einstein's equation. In regions of weak, gra weak gravitational field of the solar system, that is, for planets farther away from the Sun, Rp becomes far greater than Rs. If we factor out Rp squared from the force equation, we have this. For planets farther away from the Sun, the ratio Rs over Rp goes to zero, and the equation reduces to this. This suggests that for planets closer to the Sun, gravity acts a little stronger than usual, and this explains why the precession of Mercury is that great. This is the same conclusion you will arrive at from solving Einstein's field equation. Therefore, this analysis must be correct. So, my question to you is this. Do we really need general relativity? And share your thoughts in the comment section below. And please support this channel by liking the video. Thanks for watching.